So my husband came home today and the first thing he said to me was, why would the human mind have something in it that would essentially act as a detriment to the entity itself? What he means by that is, or what he meant by that is, and I'm paraphrasing, um, but what he's saying is, why would you, right, being a human being, or anyone, have this thing as a sort of function in its mind that is constantly negative, right, and is constantly going against its own will, Right? So, for example, you sit and you want to meditate. Meditation is, is, a, is a great example of this. You, you set in your mind a mantra and you go, I'm going to repeat this mantra. This is what I want to focus on. And I'm going to focus on this for 15 minutes. Repeat. And that is your stated will. But we all have this thing in our mind, this voice in our head that goes, no, right? So you're two minutes into the meditation, three minutes into the meditation, and all of a sudden your mind, what you think is your mind, what you believe is your mind, shifts to start to talk about something else, something unrelated. So it's not your mantra. And then it becomes a struggle, right? So on a TikTok live, for example, I remember somebody saying, like, I I still struggle with negative thoughts when I'm attempting to meditate. And that was my husband's question. Why? Because this is something that seems to occur to everyone, right? It's normative, right? If you, sorry, moving my microphone. Um, If you ask the normal, a regular person, okay, What is the hardest thing about trying to meditate? They say, well, I can't clear my mind. And of course, my response to them is, it's not about clearing your mind. It's about choosing what you're supposed to focus on. Meditation is a focus exercise. Don't allow your mind to take you off this topic. This is a very interesting, informative, and it's going to be beneficial. It's helpful. So stay with me, okay? Now, what he says is, And he asked, and it's a good question, why would your mind have or possess a mechanism in it that essentially hinders you across the board, right? It seems counterproductive by definition, and he's absolutely right. And I was so happy (laughs) that he actually paused and asked me that because one, You know, we've always, him and I have always had this relationship where I'm sort of up thinking of these sort of things, you know, up in the clouds, so to speak, and he's grounded, you know. And so when I try to have these sort of conversations with him, it sort of makes him uncomfortable. And he even followed up and he said this, the reason why I would get uncomfortable when you would talk to me about these things like consciousness and the nature of reality is that it would physically make my head hurt. And I said, yes, I know that pain because when I started down this path, I can remember that. It like felt like you literally could feel something in your brain shifting or changing or expanding. And it was uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. And so he said, it would literally cause me pain. And I said, well, does it cause you pain anymore? And he's like, no, not as much. And I said, yes. So you do move past that stage where it causes you pain. But until then, it, it's a physical reaction to new information. You feel the pain. And he said, why would that be? Why would information, it's almost like the system, and he, these are his words. He said, it's almost as though the simulation doesn't want you to think outside of a particular mindset. Like it wants you to think this way. It wants you to be negative. It wants you to 
be sort of like a, a droid or a Borg, right? Where you just, everybody thinks this way, everybody behaves this way, you, you know, for, this, for the sake of, of the hive kind of thing. And I said, that's one, one interpretation, that's one perception. I don't have, I should say I have answers, but I don't know what is accurate. But that is one. But for me, intuitively, my response was that intuitively it doesn't feel to me like it's the simulation that is at fault here. And where my mind went to was parasites. And he said, okay, well, why do you think that? I said, listen, by definition, a virus is a parasite. It's something that attaches itself to an entity or form or whatever, and it disrupts its natural function, right? Um, your mind, your brain, right? Your physical, your physical body, all of these things are susceptible to parasitic entities, right? If you're, if you can get a stomach virus or a stomach parasite or a worm, a tapeworm, right? Physically, right? That's your physical form getting a parasite. Um, because the human body is a physical machine, right? It's an organic machine. It's an organic, it's a type of organic robot in a way, right? Wetware. It can get infected by a virus, by a parasite, right? But your computer, which is hardware, right? Can also get infected by a parasite, right? Which is a virus, a computer virus. So I broke it down and I said, listen, the human body can get infected by a virus or a parasite. Your computer can inv get infected by a virus or a parasite. I said, have you ever been around a person where after you spend time with them, you walk away feeling drained? There's a term colloquially describes them as like energy vampires, right? But that's you know, in a way, they're they're not attached to you, but at the time that you are connected with them, they sort of drain you of energy, right? We call it energetic vampires, okay? Why can't you have an, a parasitic, an energy parasite? Extrapolate the micro from the macro and vice versa, right? If your computer is capable of getting infected by a virus and your physical body physically is capable of being infected by a virus and we're living in a simulation, my guess is if you're listening consistently to my podcasts, then you, you're either playing with the idea or you subscribe to the mindset that we are living in a simulation and you know but that's where I'm at. I'm both feet in. This is a simulation. Um, it's an extremely complex simulation, like I explained in previous episodes. Um, however, it's still a simulation. Uh, why can't the simulation itself be infected by a sort of parasite or a virus? And our physical forms, and for those of you who don't know, and I refer to yourself, I try to make distinctions between your physical form and I consistently say, the person that you see when you look in your mirror, it's just a vehicle, it's just a body, all right? It's just a suit that you're wearing. To use terminology from Altered Carbon, it's a sleeve, all right? Consciousness, all right, is what's controlling the body, all right? And consciousness cannot be found in the body, right? Just like in a VR game, you could be controlling an avatar. But you, the player, cannot be found in the reality that is virtual, right? You're in a different reality that's parallel to this one. And by this one, I mean like your video game world. Does that make sense? So... If I'm playing Super Mario and Luigi says, you know, there's a consciousness controlling you, Mario, and I want to go in and find the player 
and he tries to, let's say Luigi is a brain surgeon, so he tries to perform brain surgery on Mario because he's looking for you, the player that's in Earth. He's not going to find it because it's a whole different reality. Sometimes I talk to people and I try to convey to people the like the importance of detaching attachments to the physical form. Like somebody on my TikTok commented about physically traveling through time. You know, and I said no, conscious I said yes. You can travel through time, but consciousness is key. And I thought they got it, but they responded back, no, I meant physical travel. And I just like didn't respond because they weren't quite ready for what I was saying. Separate your physical form from your consciousness the way you would separate your a video game, a form in a video game from you a human being controlling a virtual character. It's like that. You will not be able to find your human brain or your human consciousness that's on earth, right? In the avatar mind of like a virtual reality game that you're playing. You really have to start looking at it in that way, okay? But that said, this is a fully immersive multiplayer role-playing video game, right? Extremely advanced. We can call it a quantum simulation. And like I said in previous episodes, I only use the terminology of simulation, you know, or I only use, you know, video game analogies because as of now, I'm operating within my understanding of technology, right? There's going to come a time when we will advance past video game and then another analogy will be used that will better fit and better describe our reality or simulated reality but for right now simulation fits when William Shakespeare spoke of all the world being a stage he's basically saying all the world is a simulation but he was using and he was speaking from his understanding right as a playwright he looked up and said oh yeah, this is a play, right? Everybody's wearing a mask, right? Personas, everyone's acting out these roles. If you would take William Shakespeare and you bring him to the 21st century and you hand him a PSVR, he would say, yeah, this is what I meant, right? But he doesn't, he did not have, or he does not have access to that technology. So he can't use the terminology. He can only use the terminology that fits him. So when I say we are living in a VR, virtual reality simulation, I'm using the terminology that fits me with the present understanding of technology that we have now. You know, the ancient Hindus, they call this a game. They call, they call this world Leela, a great game, right? But if you took a, a philosopher from, you know, ancient India, and you brought them into the 21st century and you gave them a VR helmet, they would use the terminology, ah, yes, this is what I mean. This is a virtual reality. This world is a virtual reality and we're all using our avatars to play this game, right? So we are in mortal consciousness playing a mortal game. Does this make sense? So 500 years from now, right, I will be heard somewhere, right? There will be a technology that will be able to scrub the airwaves and listen to the voices of people that came in the past. And my voice will be picked up by this technology. And people 500 years from now will be listening to me talking about this same thing. And they will have their version of virtual reality. And they will say, yes, back in 2021, a human named Joe spoke of this world being, you know, a simulation, a virtual reality, a type of virtual reality simulation. But now let's say in the 500 years from now, they have like a holodeck, right? So then they say, ah, yes, reality is a holodeck, right? Now, I think I've established that firmly enough. As all computers can be 
hacked and are susceptible to viruses, right? Your human body can be hacked and is susceptible to viruses. Your phone can be hacked and is susceptible to viruses. The human body metaphysically, spiritually, energetically can be hacked and is susceptible to energetic parasites. Now, there is a book called uh, The Future of the Mind, I believe. It's either The Future of the Mind or The Future of Humanity. It's by Michio Kaku. And in it, he talks about... Ah, yes, it's Future of the Mind by Michio Kaku. And in it, he talks about how in the future, there will be technology that... So first he talked about uh, plays, right? So we talk about the evolution, quote, evolution of uh, film. So first we have plays, right? And actors. No, first actually you had storytelling by the fireplace, right? Early uh, man, early mankind. It would sit around the fireplace and tell stories and, you know, make figures with shadows in your hands. And that was our how we entertained ourselves. And then it turned into plays, right? You wore a mask, you wore masks and costumes, and then you acted out a story. And then it evolved into like black and white films where you would see the captions, but they couldn't record voices. So it was like, uh, you know, those old black and white movies. I forget that guy, Charlie Chaplin, right? That kind of thing. And then it moved to the talkies, right? Where all of a sudden now it's like you could hear the characters like speaking. Oh, wow, that's great. And then we had, and then we started having movies. And if you look at the evolution of movies, like on my TikTok, I, I did this thing about like, what's your top, you know, like six favorite movies and what do they tell you? What is your consciousness trying to tell you, you know, by having you be attracted to these movies? Um, and I was wearing a Back to the Future t-shirt and somebody said, it's interesting that you didn't list Back to your Back to the Future as one of your favorite movies. And it actually is like a really great movie that I, I enjoy, but I didn't list it as one of my favorite movies because I guess in my mind, in order for me to sit down and whittle down what my favorite movies were, um, I gave it a category of, okay, rewatchability. Um, because I, I love so many different movies. Um, like I love Blade Runner. I love Total Recall. I love, um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, I love Penelope. Penelope is actually my favorite movie. I didn't list it on the, on the TikTok, but it's actually one, it's like my second favorite movie behind me, Joe Black. So my top three favorite movies actually guys are Men in Black. (laughs) So, uh, my top three favorite movies are Men in Black, um, Penelope and Meet Joe Black. And, uh, but the ones that I gave on the TikTok are like in my top 10. Um, so, and I mentioned Men in Black. I'm sorry, no, I mentioned um, Meet Joe Black, um, but I left out uh, Men in Black and uh, Penelope um, because I wanted to pick the movies that kind of like grouped together. So if I give you a list of like my top 10 favorite movies, it would be Men in Black, Meet Joe Black, Penelope, right? I, Robot, The Matrix, um, ooh, Brain Fart, uh, <laughs> what is it, 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 oh gosh, see, now my brain's like on the spot and I know I'm, I'm recording, I can't think of it, hold on, oh man. Okay, so The Matrix, The Matrix, I, Robot. I keep wanting to say Eternal uh, Sunshine of the Spotline, Spotless Mind, but that's not it. Um, anyway, you, you see my point? So basically when I was trying to come up with like movies to, to put together for the skit, like I got flooded with a bunch of different movies and I was like, okay, well, pick, pick the ones that kind of fit a narrative, right? That are consistent. And those are the six that I picked because they kind of fit the narrative, right? Like I, Robot, Vanilla Sky, right? Um, that's that's one I forgot about. Uh, but I, Robot, Vanilla Sky, The Matrix. Um, I think I mentioned The Truman Show, um, but The Truman Show is actually one of my favorite movies as well. Um, but they all basically, if you, if I sat, when I sat down and looked at all my favorite movies, 
um, except for like Penelope, they all basically speak to one, the nature of the rea- of our reality being false, like a construct, like the Truman Show, for example, right? Like Truman, you know, he's living his whole life thinking like his life is real, but all the while he's actually like on this TV show and doesn't even realize that he's in a TV show, right? So his reality is fake, is false. And that movie was my favorite movie when it first came out. And that movie tripped me out because like, for a while, I was like looking at everybody like, <laughs> well, how do I know that you guys aren't like actors in this movie? You know, but like, and that was like from a young age. Um, same thing with uh, The Matrix, right? So any movie that makes me, qu- that made me question the na- the nature of my reality, I was like automatically drawn to it. Um, Vanilla Sky, same thing, right? Question the nature of reality. So if you ask me what my subconscious is trying to communicate to me, it's question the nature of reality. And if you're probably thinking, well, where the hell does Penelope fit into all of these movies, right? Like iRobot, right? Um, where it's essentially a robot becomes sentient, a robot becomes self-aware, right? My subconscious is telling me, wake up, become self-aware. Don't, you know, don't fit in, right? Where does Penelope fit into this? Um, And the only thing I can tell you is that there's a line in the movie where there's a little boy and it was at the end of the movie and I won't spoil you in case you want to spoil it for you in case you want to watch it. (laughs) Um, But there's a little boy and he says, it's not the power of the curse, it's the power you give the curse. Every time I hear that line, and then the scene where she said, I just had to love myself. Like those two lines, like, oh, the emotion. Like I feel it in my chest area. Because they speak to the power of the mind, right? So what did I talk about in the previous episode? The nocebo effect and the placebo effect, right? The power of the mind and how we allow external circumstances and thoughts, right? We feel like every like everybody outside of us is more powerful, but no, we're the ones who are giving them this power. And when you become conscious of that and you love yourself, you can change your reality. And that's literally what she did in that movie, right? I'm going to spoil it. If you haven't seen it at this point, like, I'm sorry, but still go watch it because it's great. But she, when she realized, wait, I'm somebody right? I'm a blue blood and all I had to do was love myself. Like it, the curse applied to her, right? She made it into something else. So that's why, like that movie is deeper than you realize. Like it's a very deep movie. Um, <laughs> but back on track to what I was talking about, the evolution of film. You guys thought I was going to get off track, didn't you? Nah, man, I'm focused. That's what I meditate for. So I could be focused. The power of, of, of um, evolution of film, right, is, you know, we, we start from uh, storytelling to now we are in like 3D movies. And before we know it now, the next evolution of film is going to be uh, what Michio Kakao said was, um, we're going to end up Kaku, Michio Kaku. I didn't mean to destroy his name like that. But what he ends up saying is that in the future, we're not just going to sit and watch movies anymore. We're actually going to now have actors feel their emotions and then that gets transmitted through like haptic technology so that when you're watching the movie, you feel the emotion of the actor. So now, and he said a lot of actors that we have now are going to basically lose their jobs and then a new sort of uh, class of actors will come in where not only do they show the emotions but now they can transmit it and then those emotions can get recorded so then when you go and watch the movie you feel the actors fear with them you feel their excitement you feel their love alongside with them and that actor needs to not only emote that but also feel that so that that energy hello that energy can be captured and then transfer to you the viewer and and he's saying that this technology is exists right now the technology to capture the energy of emotion and then project it exists right now and what is 
what are emotions, if not energy in motion, right? So that's the thing. If they're capable of capturing your emotion and then essentially transmitting it to something else, and that tells you, and what is what is your energy? You can't feel it. You can't touch it. It's not tangible in a sense, but it is something that is capturable and transferable. Okay, there's something there. Then why wouldn't an entity... Hello, I was going somewhere with this, guys. Thank you. Um, <laughs> why wouldn't an energy want to feast on that, want to feed on that, right? Why wouldn't there exist a parasite that would feed on your energy? It is something that is that is collectible, recordable, right? Tangible. I know I just said it wasn't, it's not tangible, but I, what I mean is it's something that is capturable, right? And you can pass on energy. You can feel energy, right? If you walk into a room where people have just been angry, like uh, angering, arguing, I mean, I guess we should call it angering, actually. Uh, you can feel the anger in the room, right? It's not something you can grasp, but it's something that energetically, you feel it in your chest area, okay? We need to be aware that that is something, if I can feel it, something can feed on that. If you can transmit it, it is something that can be fed on. Ignore what I said about it not being tangible because I don't want you to get off track. Um, it is something that can be harnessed. It is energy, right? Because like like uh, Kaku said, right? they can capture this emotion and then in the future they can transmit it. Well, then it's something that is capturable, recordable, measurable right? Something can utilize, feed on the energy. Hello? Right now in China, they have these sidewalks that feed off of kinetic energy. So like human beings kind of walking, right? They use that energy to power like lights, right? So you can't touch kinetic energy, but it is something that can be captured and used. Now, if some sort of virus gets introduced to the technology and, and transfers or transmits that energy into something else, like right, feeds off of it, consumes it, transfers it to something else, right? It is, it is capable of that, right? You can develop a virus that would be able to harness the technology and use it towards something else. Right? Like I can harness a technology that can steal data from your phone. Right? I can develop a virus. I can steal information from your phone. So I'm, I'm kind of beating, you know, I'm hitting, the, I'm, I'm hitting the nail on the head repeatedly because I'm trying to drive this in because I, I'm trying to drive out any doubt because like you really need to sit and think about this deeply. You know, and I said this to my husband, I said, it's, it's got to be that, that what we think is our mind, we're told is our mind, we're told, told, told those are your thoughts. Bullshit. It's not your thoughts. If that was your thoughts, why would it conflict with what you said you wanted to do? Hello, we're talking about, hey, I want to sit down and meditate. Why can't you sit down and meditate? It's your mind. And why is this thing always negative? It's always fucking negative. It's always fucking negative. And that's what he said. It's always negative. And I said, not only is it negative, it always lies. Like it's not true. And when I, when he said that, why is it negative? And I responded, I also thought like electrons, electronics, electron is negative energy. Now this is just a theory that popped into my head. I'm sharing it with like, with you guys. Okay. Electronics. We are addicted to electronics in a way that could be interpreted as us being addicted to negative energy because an electron has a negative charge and a proton has a positive charge. So electronics work on negative charge, right? And there are things that need negative charge, right? Electricity to work. Your phone is powered by negative charge, neg 
I don't want to say negativity, but you see where I'm driving you, right? So if you have things that run on negative energy, now here's where now the artistic, you know, philosophical mind starts creeping in my right mind. So I'm giving you all this information from my left mind. Now my right mind's coming in, right? I've talked about parasites and things like that. And I go, okay, so what's my favorite movie? The Matrix. And what does the Matrix talk about? These machines, right? Machines are electric, right? They feed on electricity, right? These, these machines have sort of trapped humanity in the simulation, right? And are now feeding off. They said it was like the, their brain or whatever, but, um, but same concept, maybe not necessarily the brain, but maybe energy, right? I want to posit that we are consciousness having, you know, an experience in a simulation. But the simulation is like a sort of like a open source. Okay? And there are laws and there are rules. Okay? But just like anything that's kind of open, like androids, like androids are really easy to sort of like hack, right? Or quote jailbreak. Um, but as a result, you're also more susceptible to viruses. And I would argue that the same is with the simulation that we're in right now. It's a sort of open source simulation. And I'm not, I don't know if I'm using the terminology, right? But if you, if you're picking up what I'm putting down, thank you. Um, but you have to, I think, I think that there are more than one simulations, right? Just like ours, but with different rules. And maybe there is an Apple type, you know, simulation where it's like very, you know, I've used this analogy in my other podcast, um, the Dark Oracle's Guide to the Multiverse, but um, I'm going to like, you know, repeat it here. Uh, maybe in this reality, it's kind of more free. You know, there's still laws, right? Like like with, a, with an Android phone, with a Samsung or whatever, there's still rules. But because it's kind of more open source, your, your mind is more susceptible to viruses, right? And so most people right now, because when I, I use it, I said, well, maybe we're just infected. Maybe our minds are infected by this, you know, some sort of like energetic virus, you know? And he said... Well, that would have to be a very prolific virus because look, it's like everywhere. And I said, babe, it's, aren't we in the middle of a pandemic? <laughs> like, yeah, that's kind of how viruses work. They spread from person to person. They spread from family to family, right? If it's a mind virus, right? And your parents were, you know, their minds were infected by it. And then when you were born, like it was kind of passed on to you, right? Then yeah. That would make sense. I mean, it's a prolific, you know, virus and, and that's how viruses do. They kind of spread, right? That's how it works. So what if there's this sort of energetic parasite within the simulation? And I, I'll, I'll use virus. What if there's an energetic virus within our simulation that feeds off of negative energy? right? That is powered by negative energy. The way your electronics are powered by negative energy, by electricity, right? And it's attached itself to the human body, to the human mind even, right? There's a scene in Doctor Who. Um, I think the episode is called uh, Turn Right. You can Google it. Google Doctor Who Turn, Turn Right. And in it, Donna Noble goes to like a, a planet with the doctor and she goes into a shop and there's this entity that feeds on like potential or times like a temporal bug and it attaches itself to Donna's back and then there it has her think about a point in time where she made one different decision right she goes to a stop sign and it was a choice between turning left and turning right, right? And if she would have turned left, she would have never met the doctor, but it was her meeting the doctor that actually saved the doctor's life. And then by saving the doctor's life, 
all of these other things that, you know, all these other like positive things came from that, right? That happened simply by, by her making one little decision to turn left. And what the entity, I'm, I'm sorry, to turn right. But what the entity did was like use her mind to psychically take her back in time. It didn't explain it this way, but I'm like filling in the, the holes. Um, it took her back in time and then caused her to turn left. And as a result of it doing that, of her making that decision, the doctor died and then all of this sort of calamity sort of broke out. And then there was just a lot of chaos. And then that bug, that entity fed on all of that like energy, energy guys it's all energy and I think like what if that is sort of what's happening more or less like not maybe not to that level but what if I'm drawn to that episode because there's there's a message being communicated here now I've prefaced all of this so you got to stay with me and I guarantee, I mean, I'm, my guess is you wouldn't be listening and consistently listening to my podcast unless you, you know, resonate, you know, on some level with what I'm talking about. Okay. But the human, oh, let me finish my thought, I guess. In that episode, that bug, that, that Donna that turned left, she still had the bug on her kind of consuming, you know, potent, you know, potential energy. And people would kind of be able to see the bug, but they couldn't, right? Because it it kept phasing in and out, like it was like shifting, tempor- you know, temporally or spatially. I don't even know. I guess it was shifting in and out of dimensions um, and probability, um, probabilities rather. But people could kind of see it. So you would see in the scene, people kept looking at her back and thinking like, yo, there's like something on your back. But then like like when she would turn, you couldn't see it, but they just instinctively knew that it was there. And when I think about that, I think about like books, for example, that like The Power of Now that calls it a pain body, right? Uh, Eckhart Tolle, he wrote about this like parasitic energy. Same thing, right? It's a parasitic energy. He calls it the pain body. He says it's like, he says it's like manifested by culture or whatever. So he's not using like technical terminology, but he's more or less saying the same thing. But he's just using, he's speaking from his level of awareness, which is more of a spiritual mindset, you know? So he's looking at that and he's saying, well, there's some sort of, you know, spiritual energetic sort of parasite that feeds on pain, right? And that it will manipulate you to to basically create painful situations on that so it can feast on it. And I'm saying the same thing, but I'm using terminology that's more familiar with me, right? I'm using more of a tech, technological perspective and say, you know, well, how do viruses work, right? Viruses work by hijacking its host and then manipulating the host body in order to get it to basically be a source of food to feed its need, right? So what you consume or what you, you know, yeah, I guess what you eat or what you consume is now used not to feed yourself, not to benefit yourself, but for the parasite's benefit, right? So when my husband asked me, why would you have this thing in your mind that does not serve you at all, right? That's why the first thing that popped into my head was it's got to be a parasite because only a parasite attaches, gloms to its host and then makes it do things that doesn't serve its host. It serves them. Like I, I think of like the Toxoplasmosis gondii uh, parasite that essentially, if I remember correctly, it like attaches itself to like a rat or something like that. And then it makes the rat like walk up to loses its fear of cats so that the cat will consume the rat consume the parasite and then like proliferate within the cat google it it's gross it's like the only reason why i don't like i want a cat but i don't want a cat because like it actually like it can even pass on to humans and then change human behavior and that's just a physical, like, organic parasite, okay? Extrapolate the micro 
uh, the macro from the micro, right? If, if like, and I'll re- reiterate, if your computer is capable of getting viruses, if your, bo- your body is capable of getting viruses, if your gut itself is capable of getting like a parasite or virus, um, then we need to start thinking energetically, right? There's got to be energetic parasites. There's got to be things that feed on us. So you have even stories like a, like a vampire, you know, like they feed on blood, right? That a vampire is a type of parasite. It's funny, I've just been uh, watching uh, Travelers on Netflix. It's a really good show. Surprise. Maybe I'm not surprised, but it's not renewed. It's a really good show. Um, but in it, there was this one episode we just finished watching yesterday where there was an emerging AI that had been transmitted via nanobots into a young child. And it like took over the child's body and the father of the child called in a priest and I said oh interesting so now they're trying to use um technology in a way to explain uh demon possession and I thought okay that's cool I like that so I tabled that and then as the episode kind of went along then the AI bit one of the characters the main character one of the main characters rather, and then the nanobots, right, or the nanites, you know, that the AI had taken control of, transferred out of the little girl into uh, a traveler's body, into a new host body. And I thought, oh, interesting. So now they're using, you know, technology to, to sort of play with the idea of like zombies, right? Or even vampires, right? Um, but transmission of a virus, right? That AI, that emerging conscious, that AI that was seeking a host, you know, they said, well, it's looking for a body. You know, it's a parasite and it, it came into a person's body, hijacked the consciousness or whatever, and then kind of manipulated it to serve its needs. Negativity, anger, criticism, all of that negative energy does not serve you. It sickens you, Right? Fear does not serve you. It sickens you. And yet we continuously like sort of are bombarded with these like images, right? And it seems like we live in a world that's essentially set up to stoke negative energy in people. And I just sort of wonder what's really going on. You know, now as I'm talking and look, this is my podcast. You either, you're either, you either get me at this point or you don't. And if you don't, I doubt you would have listened to this part. So I'm just going to say what I, what I think is kind of how I roll. Um, but, you know, we believe or we think that if aliens were going to sort of be amongst us, that they would be humanoid, right? So we expect little green men or Martians or Klingons or Vulcans or whatever, and that's fine. But... You know, we need to really start expanding our minds um, as far as what our concept of aliens will look like. You know what I mean? Like, why do they have to be humanoid? Like, why can't they be energetic? I'll say this again. Why do they have to be humanoid? Why can't they be energetic? Why can't they be non-corporal, non-corporal, rather? Right? If you have an astral body, if you don't believe in astral projection, I don't know what to tell you, um, but it's real. And you literally can Google CIA and astral projection and, and go crazy um, because <laughs> it, it's legit. It's a thing. Um, and people talk about their astral bodies or whatever that are different from their physical bodies. So clearly... That's energy here. That's energy that's being discussed, right? So there's a separation from the physical form. You have your energy, whatever you want to call it. You can maybe even argue that your astral body is a sort of photonic photonic representation of your consciousness or a photonic projection of your consciousness. I don't know. But astral bodies are real, okay? And if an astral body can travel to parallel, you know, universes, 
which is people who have astral projected have written about. Then <laughs> astral bodies from other universes can come here. And they may not all, they don't have to all be human. Or if they are human, they may want different things. Right? A physical form, a human body needs like food. Right? As energy. So the reason why you eat is because you're consuming energy, right? There's energy in the food, calories, or whatever. So it's all energy. It's all energy, you guys. It's all energy. Okay. So what would then, what would an astral body, a non-corporal, corporal means body, right? Corpse, you know, corpse. So non-corporal meaning it doesn't have a body, but it's an entity that doesn't have a body, okay? What would a non-corporal entity need to feed on? Or what, let's, let's keep it on topic. What would a non-corporal parasite need to feed on? It still needs energy, it can attach itself to your form and then feed off negative energy, right? I just had this thought of like Monsters, Inc., but if you're not familiar with Monsters, Inc., essentially these monsters would go to children's homes and scare them and then capture fear energy, right? It's all saying the same thing. Right? We're all trying to communicate, our artists of this world are trying to communicate to the rest of us in different ways that there is something that is feeding off of our energy. There, is, there are entities in this world, viruses, whatever you want to call it, right? Just like I said, I can use the terminology of a simulation because that's my understanding, right? But then William Shakespeare can use the terminology of, you know, it's a play because that's his understanding. So Eckhart Tolle can say it's a pain body, right? It's an emotional parasite because that's his understanding. And I can say it's a virus, right? It's a computer virus that's attached itself to, to the, you know, the human machine mind, right? Or I could even say it's a non-corporeal virus, not a humanoid form, but an energetic virus that has attached itself. And just like your computer runs on electricity, what if this virus, the energy it needs is negativity, right? Electrons are negative energy. So we are, you're listening to me right now on a device that feeds on negative energy, Yo, this is like profound, guys. This is not to pat myself in the back. I'm saying that this is important. You've got to listen to this because once you become aware of it, you can separate from it, right? How do you... What is the antivirus? I'm, te I'm tempted to say microdosing mushrooms, but... I would say look into it. This is not an endorsement of magic mushrooms um, because it's an illegal drug. Considered and it's considered, I should say, an illegal drug. Okay, so I am not endorsing an illegal drug, nor am I encouraging you to break the law. I am saying that CNN and ESPN both have done exposés or I guess documentaries would be a better term on how powerful psilocybin is. So do your research. I'm not encouraging you uh, <laughs> to break the law, okay? Um, because right now a plant or a fungi uh, is against the law. Now, I do think it's funny though that in Super Mario Brothers... Mario used plants and mushrooms to perform, to become super, right? To perform, to, to, to kill 
reptilians. <laughs> I don't believe in reptilians. I'm just saying, guys, like, though, you know, pay attention. What do the reptilians represent? All right. So we think when we say, oh, they're reptilians running the world, we automatically think humanoids, right? But then when people take hallucinogens, they all encounter reptilian entities when they take like heroic, so-called heroic doses, which I wouldn't recommend, but, but you know, to each their own. But when people take heroic doses of uh, psilocybin and hallucinogens, they all encounter the same reptilian being. So in our minds, right, we think, oh, it's like, do 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 like like an actual like reptile creature, you know, like oh, pull back the human face and there's an actual reptile. But what have I said throughout this episode? Like it's they're all kind of analogies for something else, right? From our understanding, I personally, when I took. Uh, my first sort of dose of magic mushrooms. I, I wasn't microdosing. I took like a, I didn't take a heroic dose because I know what I'm capable of. Um, I think I took like a fifth or something like that. Don't even quote me on that because I just don't know. Um, but it wasn't like, it was like a handful, a small handful, a very, very small, tiny handful. Okay. Um, but I encountered like the same thing. Like I kept, I closed my eyes and I saw like this dragon thing like dragon energy kind of thing um and i talked about that on my uh, magic mushroom trips um and the fact that those two things kind of occur uh mushrooms and reptiles on super mario brothers is interesting to me um as well but off slightly off track if you if if you want to know what i think the antiviral is i think that that's what it is like like just like any viruses like if you take a virus what is a cure well it tends to be you know like found in nature you know what i mean so if you have a virus in the mind right you've got to take something that exists in nature that will affect your mind right and that to me has been the only thing that I can think of that has affected my mind positively, positively, right? Because you want to, you want to negate, right? You want to balance, you want to balance out. So if your mind is negative, right, you want something that's going to introduce positive energy, right? And an influx of positive energy should cause the negative energy or the entity, the virus that feeds off of the negativity to kind of fall off. So, for example, um, wormwood is great. Like, it's a great anti-parasitic. Do your research. Um, but I take a lot of wormwood. If I find that I've con- consumed too much sugar, uh, wormwood is disgusting. <laughs> but if I consume too much sugar, if I start feeling some sort of, like, gut issues, like stomach, like I might, it's like a stomach bug, I take warm wood and this is not medical advice i'm just telling you what i take and it is so bitter but it counters whatever i just the parasites that you know that i may have consumed that would be causing a stomach bug they don't like it and it kills them um so it's like but i didn't eat something bitter in order to get you know the parasite right I ate something sweet, and so the to me the way I view it is that the warm wood is like the bitter that counteracts the sweet. Um, so the same thing with mushrooms. Mushroom is like the it makes your mind positive, and it counteracts the negative, so that you are no longer food, right? Or your mind or your mental energy. Now you're not radiating negative energy anymore. Now you're radiating positive energy, but it can consume positive energy right your phone needs electricity right it cannot run on proton right so if you connect your phone to something that is protonic your phone is not gonna run it's not gonna work so it's the same thing if you turn your mind and you make it more positive right then this thing this virus kind of dies because it can't feed cannot feed on you okay um, and then another way, another good antiviral uh, is meditation. Yeah, yeah, guys, I'm, I'm always going to mention it now. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and um, 
And the reason why meditation is interesting is because when you pick something to focus on, actually, hold on one second. All right, sorry, had to um, reboot the recording device. Okay, so here's my theory on why meditation works. When you mention meditation to people, the first thing they think about is, oh, I have to clear my mind. And so they think it's a mind clearing exercise. And I said it before, I'll say it again. It's not a mind clearing exercise. It's a focus exercise. But now I want to correlate it to what we've been discussing in this episode. The reason why it helps is because what your mind does all day is constantly feed you negative thoughts. And I'm actually hesitant to say it's your mind doing this. I think I can say that we can that we've established that it's not your mind it's something else so let's say it's a virus let's say that like majority of humans were infected with this you know non-corporal mind virus that needs you to create negative energy so it's constantly saying negative things right um so just like um, on Monsters, Inc., they need the negative energy, so they create fear, right? So they scare them to produce this negative energy. So this thing needs negative energy. So it scares you or it says negative things because it, it you know, it derives this energy from negativity. So I'm going to call it a virus. I'm not going to say it's your mind. So I want you to start separating your mind from the virus okay so that you're not attributing these thoughts to you because when you attribute the thoughts to you you're more likely to listen to it right and take it in and then it becomes a battle so i'm saying it's a virus and it's a virus that feeds on negativity that's why it's constantly saying negative things that's why it's constantly imagining negative things and that's why it creates negative energy in you Now, the reason why negativity, I'm sorry, the reason why meditation works is that one, if you give yourself a mantra to focus on, or if it's a breathing that you're focusing on, all it's doing is really, if we're breaking it down so it fits into this episode and what we're discussing is, it takes your mind away from listening to what the virus's program is. It's trying to generate negative energy in you, right? And it shifts it to something sort of neutral something you know like mild like just a mantra or something like that but as your mind is repeating a mantra or focusing on you know your breath or whatever it's not focused on the virus's sort of repetition and negativity and so once you're not when you switch your focus one you're controlling what your mind will focus on so you're taking control right, of the mind, but two, you're no longer generating negative energy, right, and to imagine this thing feeds off of your negative energy, so imagine that bug on your back, like I mentioned with Donna Noble on the Doctor Who episode, it needs that negative energy, but if your mind is no longer creating or generating negative energy, then it should starve and eventually fall off. And then once it falls off, that's when people who have meditated for years go, oh, now I can clear my mind. Well, your mind is clear. It's not you clearing your mind. It's that your mind has been cleared of this virus that feeds off of your negativity. And now it's just you and your mind or you and your mantra or you and the silence, right? So to me, that's why it works. Um, here's how I try, I I want you guys to start looking at the act of meditation and I actually realized this today. So I used to use like a mantra and I think I've shared my mantra with you guys. It was, um, George Harrison song, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari, Hari, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, 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 Hari, Hari. Now I had the revelation that I just shared with you guys today. And while I was meditating, I had a second revelation. And here's here was here's the revelation. The people who came up with the mantra that I'm repeating, right? 
So at first I thought, well, let me pick a mantra. And I even said it on the podcast. Let me pick a mantra where I don't know what it means. Because then my mind isn't focused on the meaning of it. And now trying to like use that as a distraction, you know, to kind of spin a story from that. It's just something that doesn't mean anything. But the, the problem with that is that the people who did use the mantra, it meant something to them. And the repetition of Hari Rama, Hari Rama, um, it's it's a prayer to their God. It means nothing to me, but it is a prayer. It's an it's an evocation of their God, of a Hindu God, you know, um, Krishna. Um. So I took a step back and I said, okay, uh, what have I been saying, you know, forever? Right, the mind is powerful. Right, the mind shapes reality. All is mind. The universe is mental. Right, I've been saying all of this in different ways. Right, the simulation is, you know, consciousness affects reality, mind over matter, all of that. And I meditate now for about one to two hours a day in the morning. Because I'm not saying you have to do this. It's just I tend to have more energy in the evening. Right, I'm not what they say uh, or call. A morning person in the sense of I'm not cranky in the morning. It just takes me a while to get my day going. So I tend to be more uh, energetic and more ambitious and in the evening. So I meditate in the morning because, you know, to me, that's a better use of your time. My husband's not like this. He tends to wind down in the evening. I could stay up, you know, but then he gets up in the morning. So, <laughs> um, so I have to go to sleep. Um, so that I don't, you know, because I can't necessarily sleep in because I'm also a light sleeper. So he would be better served meditating at night. Um, I'm better served meditating in the morning. But as I lay, you know, down or sat down to meditate uh, this morning, uh, I caught myself repeating the mantra and I was fighting. And then I thought, okay, so hypochondria right? Psychosomatic disorders, nocebo, placebo. These are all prime examples of the mind manifesting changes in physical form and physical reality by you focusing on something, right? So the three things that I mentioned, a hypochondriac, um, uh, psychosomatic disorders, and nocebos, those are negative. It's interesting that all of all the things of all the examples of the mind essentially affecting matter um the primary examples that we have are negative things and you only have one positive change and that's a placebo effect right um and that tells you how firmly this negativity virus is uh affixed into the simulation so i don't think the nature of our simulation was to be infected Right, by this negativity virus is what I'm calling it now, the negativity virus, right? Um, just like it's not the nature of your of your computer to have a virus, right? It's meant to operate in a particular way. And it's something hijacks it and makes it and is using it, right, to serve its purpose, to serve its virus's purpose, not the user's, you know, purpose, right? So you buy a computer, you want your computer to behave a particular way. So you upload your consciousness into the human body, you want the body to behave in a particular way. Now it's got this virus and the virus has hijacked its function and it's now using your body to create negative energy and it feeds off the negativity. It feeds off the negative energy. You don't benefit from the negative energy that your own body is consuming or creating. So I'll say it again. You do not in any way, shape or form benefit at all from the negative energy that your own mind and your own body is consuming. This virus benefits from it and it will drain you. It will use you and it will drain you, right? And it will feed off of you, and it will drain you, right? So the way you fix that is you no longer become a food source, right? Do do not give it what it needs, which is negativity. Now, people are like, oh, power of positive thinking, or you fight negative thoughts or whatever, but it's not, to me, it's not about that. To me, it's about you just don't give your mental, don't give your energy to the negative thoughts, right? But more importantly, I'm going to bring in the mantra. If you're going to sit and meditate for 15 minutes at a time, right? So I mentioned last episode about how my mom, she said she didn't go to, want to go to work and she kind of focused on that. She focused her mind sort of carelessly 
but she focused her mind on that sort of negative thought. I don't want to go to work. That's negative, right? So she fed it that and then it created, she inadvertently created a situation where now she can't go to work because she hurt her foot, right? Right, so it, there, all of these disorders that I mentioned, you know, psychosomatic disorders, or hypochondria, that, that is evidence that the mind, if you focus on something, your mind can manifest changes in physical reality. Okay, so if I am going to sit and focus on a mantra, I need that mantra to be something, like I need to use that time efficiently shouldn't I right so what I decided today was instead of focusing or repeating a mantra that I don't understand why don't I make my mantra something that benefits me right and so instead of repeating the Hari Rama I changed it because I know now I operate you cannot tell me differently like if you tell me your mind cannot affect your reality, I will walk away from you, miss me with that negativity. There's too much evidence that exists that says that you are, you know, that's not even you talking, that's your mind virus talking. And I'm not trying to even engage with that because you're not going to feed off my energy, right? So I would walk away from you. There's too much evidence that shows that the mind absolutely does affect the body and it absolutely does affect reality. It absolutely does affect matter right? Not to mention the double slit experiment, like where we see consciousness affecting, you know, things on a quantum level, okay? I'm not even bringing that into this topic right now. I'll just focus on what we do know, nocebo, placebo, you know, hypochondriacs, you know, and psychosomatic disorders. That's your mind affecting change. So look, that's easy. That's Googleable. You can prove it. Like it happens. It's, it's a thing. So why... Am I sitting and spending two hours repeating a mantra, you know, that has more of a religious meaning when I'm not really a religious person, right? I'm not saying I, I don't believe in, you know, aspects and truths that some religions provide, but I'm not, it doesn't carry the same meaning to me as a person who really believes in Krishna, right? Does. Get, get what I mean? So the emotion is different. The energy is different. So I'm using something incorrectly, right? I'm just repeating a mantra because somebody said repeat a mantra and da, 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 da. But if you go back to the ancients, they use that meaning because they, they use that mantra because they were trying to connect with God. It, that mantra was fused with energy for them. And I've read in books on TDM and stuff like that that says, well, you can take that, you know, energy that's been infused in that word or in those in those mantras and kind of use it to affect change in your life. But that's somebody's hypothesis that I constantly am challenging the status quo for me. I'm going to create a mantra that I can use for my benefit because if I'm going to sit and spend two hours of my life, I'm going to use it towards actualizing a reality experience that I want to see, that I want to consciously experience. So instead of repeating Hari Rama today, I repeated, uh, I made a mantra out of um, an, a life experience that I want to have happen. Now, I watched the OA. The OA is produced by uh, Brad Pitt's a production company. And um, I saw that uh, every time the credits rolled up, that came up and I was like, bet. Okay, cool. This guy's deep. So my mantra today was, I will work with Brad Pitt on a project. I will work with Brad Pitt on a project. Yo, when I'm telling you the energy was different, the vibe was different, no negative thought could compete. It was like I walked in the darkness with a lantern and that shit went whoosh. Like I can meditate meditate rather on that all day. All day. There's nothing that can compete with that. And sure enough, like I was sitting there and my mind, let me tell you when I say my mind was still cuz I'm operating from the mindset that I know. I know that I can feed my thoughts energy right? And with enough of my energetic, you know, 
feeding, I don't know, <laughs> right? I can grow, you know, a desire into a reality, an actualized reality experience. Like I know this stuff. So why am I going to sit and put that energy into some mantra that really isn't like, it doesn't really mean anything to me when I can take that same energy and fucking put it towards a reality experience that like would be dope as fuck. Guys, when I say I was like animated, like I, I like I was looking forward, like when I was done meditating, I was like looking forward to like meditating again. Because like even throughout the day, I've just been thinking about that. Like, yeah, guys, and I'm telling you that the negative thoughts just like it was not even about me fighting them. Like I would rather my in my mind right now, I know like if I know if I focus on something, you can feed it. Like I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. I, I have people in my family that are hypochondriacs that will literally worry themselves sick. And end up in the hospital and manifest symptoms in their body. And it's not them, right? They have this mind virus that is like really attached to them and it, it's feeding off of their energy. It's transforming and, you know, transmogrifying their, you know, their, their strength, right? And it's like making it negative. I, I, I see that. I've, I've seen it. My mom, like, I've seen her, you know, like manifest or actualize whatever word you want to use. I don't like the word manifest. That's why I stopped because it's not, you're not. You're not like, oh, I'm manifest, I'm creating reality. No, you're just, the, the reality experiences already exist. All you're doing is actualizing them. You're shifting your mind to that experience, right? With your, you know, expressed desires and your actions, your conscious actions. So she put her house on the market and she said, you know, my house will sell. So I've seen her use it for good, right? Consciously. When she desires something, she sits and she prays on it. She's very, very religious. She sits and she prays, prays on it, and it works. Unfortunately, she she's allowing this mind virus to use her energy in the opposite way, you know, in a negative way. And you're seeing it happen. So with her leg, you know, getting injured or whatever. Like, and then I told you last week or last episode about her trip to Atlanta. She didn't want to leave, and she was like, I don't want to go back home you know, uh, in an early flight and her flight got delayed. And I'm like, you keep like actualizing shit. <laughs> like watch what you're thinking about. So you cannot tell me. In fact, I feel like all of these experiences that happened just this month of April were meant to teach me like, no, there's like, th these are facts. There's power here. So I was like excited. Like when I thought of this and I wanted to share it with you guys, like, yo, I could take this. I could take my energy. Why would I feed bad shit? right? Because the moment focus, focus is powerful, guys. Like if you focus on something like my my art, like that's the reason why my art's so good is because I'm focusing my creative energy on it, right? I'm not manifesting it. I'm actualizing it. I'm sitting and I'm putting in the focus. And then the focus is what brings it into, you know, this reality, right? It's what actualizes it. I'm not, you know, I'm not the one really doing it. it. I'm the one actualizing these these images or whatever, right? And I explained that in the past episode. Why wouldn't I want to put my energy towards something that, like an experience that I want to have? Like, why would I want to grow that? Why would I want to energetically feed that? Why would I want to energetically feed negative stuff? Like, what? miss me with that. And I ended up meditating for like, almost like three hours, like two and a half hours. I was just, and, I, and sometimes I might say I fall asleep. This time I was like, nope. And like psh, any thought that tried to come up that was like on some other like bullshit, I was like, nope, nope, nope. I will work with Brad Pitt on a project. I will work with Brad Pitt on a project. And like even throughout the day, like I've just been thinking about that, thinking about that, thinking about that. And so now it's like it's become like it's becoming energized right but it's positively energized so now when this thought tries to come up now i've got like a shield against that that actually serves me right so i'm putting my energy into something that's actually going to serve me and deflect these negative thoughts off my mind yo I'm for this. You guys try this. If you're trying to lose weight, it doesn't make any sense for you to sit and meditate on Ari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari Hari. I just realized that. 
any other mantra that you paid all that money for, like, I'm sorry. If it works for you, I guess keep doing it. But for those of you who have had a hard time with that, and it's not, you're not, you're finding it's not working for you, yo, pick something that you actually want to, like, experience, right? I will lose 30 pounds. I will lose 30, and not just, like, while you're meditating, like, think of that throughout the day. Like, I repeat my mantras through the day, right? Like, I repeat my mantras throughout the day. I will lose 30 pounds. 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 Like imagine like throughout your day, like your brain tries to come up with somebody cuts you off and you're like right before you're about to be like, say something, here comes your mantra. I will lose 30 pounds. I guarantee you when you sit to grab something to eat and you've been saying, I will lose 30 pounds, like, and you're looking at that donut, like, it might hit you differently. You know what I mean? Like that, that mantra might hit you differently where you're about to get that donut and then you're hearing your own mind instead of saying, oh yeah, eat that donut, right? Or whatever. Like you hear it saying, I will lose 30 pounds. You might put the donut down and go, yeah, I'm not even hungry. Right? Or I, I, I'm going to earn a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to earn a hundred thousand dollars. Well, why not? It doesn't have to be like a religious thing, right? You know what I mean? Like you can take that energy that you would spend sort of strengthening somebody else's mantra and make your own mantra. I don't know if it's going to work for you, but I'm telling you right now it it is working for me. And it actually, for me personally has worked better like I didn't struggle as much with my thoughts anymore because I know that I can energetically grow something and if I can energetically grow something by focusing on it like you beam your light of consciousness like your brain your your mind your focus your light of consciousness is like the sun all right so you plant the seed of an experience that you want to have all right you put it in the dirt, you put it in the darkness that is your mind. Okay? And now, do you like leave it in the darkness? Or do you shine the line of light of your consciousness on it? Right? Your focus on it, right? Because that's the creative energy. It's focus, it's flow. Right? What that does is it serves to give you it serves as a mantra, it gives your mind something to hold on to. But it's also like you now become protective of that, right? So when these others, these negative thoughts try to creep in, you treat them, you know, you treat those thoughts like they're weeds. Now I get the hell out of here with that. Nope. 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 And I guess because I've I've spent such a, you know, such a, a good amount of time holding, like repeating mantras, you know what I mean? So like, I, I don't even focus too much on it. I just, I know that it's going to happen. You know what I mean? But I think you can even expand it to like anything, right? Like I'm going to earn $10,000, you know, a month. I'm going to earn $10,000 a month. And there's no like, there shouldn't be any agitation around it. There shouldn't be any like, you know, you're not fighting it. It, Like literally, don't even think about it. Like don't overthink it. Just hold it in your mind and repeat it like a mantra the way like, you, you know, you would mindlessly repeat just a regular mantra. You know, you don't worry too much about what it means. You're just repeating it. It's just, you're still using the mantra as a focus exercise, right? You're still focusing on that, right? So your mind starts to drift and then you're bringing it back to the mantra the same way you would do any sort of, you know, like breath and meditation or whatever, right? Like, but you're still bringing it back to what you want to focus on, right? But at least it's something that, hey, if I'm going to feed something for two hours, I'd rather it be something that benefits me. Why not? Why not? I'm going to have a good day today. I'm going to have a good day today. I'm going to have a good day today. Why not? Why not? I feel personally, I think if you pick like a long-term goal, then, you know, that helps. But with that in my mind now, that actually has started changing the way I'm like doing things. You know what I mean? Like, as far as like, okay, like I, I, you know, I got stuff to write now. You know what I mean? Like, 
because now it's in my mind. It's like a goal, you know? So once you take a goal instead of writing it down, I mean, write it down, but make it your mantra. You know, take something that works and modify it to fit you. Like always, 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 guys, always take something, you know, if, if something that everybody's doing, don't just like do it because everybody's doing it in one way. Like sometimes it works doing things the way everybody else is, you know, is doing it. That's fine. But sometimes you got to ask yourself, well, why is it being done in that way? And if you don't know why it's done that way, then maybe you should pause and figure out, well, can I do it a different way? Can I make this better for me? So I'm not saying it works for you. It, you know, if it works for me, it's going to work for you. Make it your own. You know, if a, if a, if a Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari Hari works, when it doesn't mean anything, and that helps you. As long as you're choosing what you focus on, that works for you, great. This works for me. I found that it actually works better. And every once in a while, like, I'll still toggle. Like I noticed, like I'll toggle between, you know, repeating my mantra of, you know, my normal mantra, Hari Rama, and then switching to like a reality, you know, experience that I want to actualize. So I'll, I'll toggle, I'll go back and forth or whatever. And that's fine. But what at the end of the day is happening is that my negative thoughts are like pff, gone. Like, it's not like they don't exist. It's like, it's just as they start creeping up, like I literally visualize them as weeds and I go, no. But more profound than all of that is that you really do need to sit with what I've said in this episode. Look, I don't have three, you know, three letters behind my name, but neither did Buddha. Hear what I mean? Neither did Christ. You know what I mean? And some of you might raise an eyebrow, like, yo, is she drawing comparisons to Christ and Buddha? Yes, I am. And so should you. You see, Christ wasn't a Christian. And neither was Buddha. Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. You know, these were men that came, human beings that came and said, you can be like me. In fact, you can be greater than me. This is what you're capable of. Like, they said that. Right? Right? Be like me. You can be enlightened. Right? You can be, quote, saved. Right? You can be like God. You are God. You are children of God. They came telling you the message. But yet we've been programmed to say, no, I'm below. You know, I've got to worship. i got to, you know, call this man Lord. Well, if you have a Lord, then you're a slave. If you're Christian, Christ didn't say, I came to be a master over you. He said he came so that you can have life and have life more abundantly. Have an abundant life. He said, you know, I am God. So are you. You are children of God. Your father is in heaven. I'm not a religious person, but I hear the truth where I hear it. Right? Buddha didn't say if you sit under the Bodhi tree and starve yourself, right? Eventually you will gain enlightenment. He says enlightenment is for all. And in fact, is when he let go of the religious stuff that that made him fast and made him suffer, you know, and sit under the tree. It was when he that was when he became enlightened. And I don't have to do this. Why am I doing this to myself? So I'm saying to you, you know, I can learn from a child. In fact, children speak more truth than adults because they're closer to the source, right? They're, they're just, they're fresh back from like when they come into this world, right? They're closer to, you know, the world outside of this one. Like they just logged in. So there's still part of them that remembers what the other world is like. You can learn from anyone. And I'm telling you, You really start got to you really have to start thinking about the voice in your head. The voice in your head that's not you. You really got to start looking at it as a non-corporeal sort of parasite or a virus. Right? Your your the human mind is a computer, right? The analogy we always use like your brain is some sort of like a type of a quantum computer. You hear them talk about this, right? 
Even Dean Buonomano wrote, the brain is a time machine. But the mind is a machine. The brain is a machine. And any machine, any machine, any sufficiently advanced machine can be hacked, is susceptible to viruses, just like your computer. And I would argue, I'm positing that, that voice in your head that is constantly feeding you negative you know, thoughts, it's doing it not to serve you. Does it serve you? How have you ever benefited from continuously imagining like all the worst case scenarios? How does that? It makes you suffer. That's not fun. You're constantly fighting it. So it doesn't serve you, right? When you react, right? And somebody says something when you, when you are afraid, right? You, you're, you're constantly generating this negative energy. How, that's not for your benefit. You're not, gen, you're not benefiting yourself. In fact, you're making yourself sick. Something is benefiting from that and it's in your head. How does it hurt to look at it as, okay, my mind has been affected by a negative, you know, an energy parasite, an energy virus that feeds off of my body's ability to generate negative energy. Like I said, your phone is a, a, a machine, right, that runs off of negative energy. Literally, electrons are negative energy. So if you have a machine like your phone that runs off negative energy, right, then that means that there are other things that can, that need negative energy. And it doesn't mean that this parasite is evil or this virus is evil. Like that's us attaching our own sort of understanding to it. It is what it is, right? Your phone's not evil if it feeds off of negative energy. It just is, right? If you, if an animal eats another animal, Right, the animal's not evil because it needs a food source to eat. It just needs to eat. Right? So if something has kind of hijacked your mind and is using your body to generate negative energy, it's not evil. But you don't have to be a food source either. <laughs> right? If you see a mosquito and it's sucking your blood, do you let that shit sit on you? If you're not aware of it, it's one thing. Right, but if you don't, especially if the mosquito has like malaria, which is a parasite, um, right? If you see it, bringing it all together, guys, you see it, you get it off your body. You don't just let it sit and suck your blood or a leech. You don't let it sit and suck your blood. The leech isn't evil. It just needs a food source, which is your blood, right? The mosquito isn't evil. It just needs a food source, which is your blood. Right, a fly isn't evil. It just likes to land on you and shit on you, and I guess it eats something. I don't even know why flies, but are on your body. But I'm sure they are doing something fucked up. Uh, but they're not evil. That's just their nature. So this energetic non-corporeal sort of virus that has attached itself to the human mind, it has invaded, has entered into the simulation. Right, it's not evil, and you know, it's not a full-scale. Like infection, it seems to only really be affecting the human race, right? You don't have dogs running around thinking negative thoughts. So it seems like it's only something that it affects just humans. And, you know, as far as like all those living species on this planet are concerned, like we're not that much. I mean, there's far more bugs for sure, right? And they have their own consciousness. So there's far more bugs than there are humans. You get it? Um, so whatever it is that this thing is, it's not evil. It just feeds off negative energy right? If you don't fight it, right? One, one option you can do is you train your mind in meditation. Because if you're focusing on a mantra, then you're not focusing on the negative thoughts, right? And feeding and generating negative energy for it to feed on. Another thing you can do is if you watch your thoughts, and then you notice that they're negative, if you can imagine, you know, bad things, negative things, you can also convert it consciously change it if your mind goes oh this you know this person didn't call because they don't like you if you catch your mind doing that you can convert it right because when you when you feel that when you hear that thought this person didn't call because they didn't like you what do you feel pay attention to that feeling bring your consciousness to that feeling because that feeling is a hey hello hi 
Something is generating a thought in your head. This virus is generating negative energy. You're feeling it in your chest and it's not being used by you. It doesn't serve you. Something is siphoning that energy. So you use that change in your energetic state as like a like a wake up, like for you to go, whoa, 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 something is sucking my blood. Something is, you know, taking my energy. Something is in my mind. This virus is in my mind and it's activating, you know, my energy. Would you rather have your energy be consciously utilized for a purpose that serves you or for food for something else, right? So you can use that and then you go, nope. A person didn't call because, you know, they're busy. You know, they've got a lot going on. You know what I mean? So once you change that, then it stops generating the energy. I guarantee you, if I am right, and I probably am, eventually you're going to get yourself in a state where you switch from being positive from being negative right and being this food source to being positive and this thing needs that energy to feed on you if you're no longer producing that energy it will starve and die right 